Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the um, inaugural online construction contracts conference brought to you today by Built Environment Networking. My name is Phil Laycock. I'm one of your hosts for today. Today's conference partner is HKA. Um, HKA is one of the world's leading privately owned independent providers of consulting, expert and advisory services for the construction, manufacturing process and technology industries. They were established over 40 years ago. They imply much employ more than 500 expert witnesses in addition to over 500 advisors and consultants across 50 countries in 19 countries, 50 offices in 19 countries with the skills and experience that are essential to get to the heart of even the most complex issues. Their global portfolio includes prestigious projects on every content and in market sectors that include buildings, industrial, infrastructure, oil and gas, power and utilities and uh, technology. We are delighted to have them as our conference partners today. I'd also like to thank our national partners, Wilmot Dixon, Pagabo, IFC, CLS, Frame, Perfect Circle, Cornerstone, New Former, and the CIOB. Many of them are here today in the exhibition area and also attending the conference. So today represents a step forward in technology and moves us all into a, a new online networking and conference space with access to the networking area and the exhibition area. And there is so much more functionality for meeting other delegates, meeting the exhibitors and speakers. And I have no doubt that this will become the new normal for conferences in the future. So this online conference will focus on three specific forms of contract, uh, JCT, NEC and uh, FIDIC. Each will be covered in a specific session and the three of them will run throughout the day with breaks in between for networking and also for visiting the exhibition area. So we hope that you'll join us for these sessions throughout the Day and also take advantage of the networking breaks. You can ask questions during the session via the chat function, which is down the right hand side of the screen, and myself or one of the other speakers will refer to these questions at the appropriate time. So, session one. In this session, we're going to take a look at JCT contracts with a particular focus on JCT 16 design and build contract and also JCT 16 standard building contract. Our experts for the session are John Jones, partner at HKA, um, Helen Thompson, who is a legal director at 13 Group, and Matt Chandler, who is an associate director at Godwin Developments. We will first and foremost hear from John, who's going to introduce the session, and then we'll have some predetermined questions, and we will invite questions from you, the audience, if you have anything that you would like to ask. So, John, I will hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Phil. Good morning, everybody. Um, firstly, on behalf of HK, I'd just like to say that we're delighted to be partnering with the uh, Built Environment Networking team this morning to deliver today's session. Um, when I was uh, trying to munch through my cornflakes this morning and trying to usher the, the kids through the door as they're thankfully gone back to school this week, um, I did just capture on the news that... Uh, um, the, the news that uh, the, the UK economy has, has shrunk or did shrink by 20.4%, I think it was, in, in April. So quite shocking figures there. Um, so I suppose today's session is, is, is quite timely in terms of how construction can assist with sort of driving the economy again and, and help to, to, to bring the economy back to, to full health. Now, looking at today's uh, session and today's webinar schedule, also looking at the exhibition areas and also the uh, speed networking opportunities. I think we're in for a, a really uh, exciting day and a really uh, insightful um, day and hopefully some really good discussions that can be had. Now, if similar to myself, you've been working from home, then I'm sure you know engaging on uh, webinars and uh, online learning activities are, are quite familiar to yourselves. Now, hopefully, we've got something slightly different um, this morning. In that, you know, we're going to we're, we're not going to have a formal presentation as such. So maybe slightly more informal. In that, uh, we'll have a panel discussion, and the idea is to bring together, of course, a, a diverse mix of of industry experts and to discuss the situation with COVID nineteen, with a particular focus on three standard industry forms of contract. Now, as Phil mentioned, this morning's session, we're going to focus on JCT. And I'm delighted to be joined by Helen and, and Matt on the panel this morning. Now, I think it'll be, it'll be helpful to give you some context to your panel. And so I'll give you just a, a slightly 
um, more in-depth introduction to, to who you've got on your panel this morning. So firstly, as Phil mentioned, we've got Helen Thompson, who is the legal director at 13 Group. Now, 13 Group are one of the UK's most uh, active and innovative social housing developers with a particular focus on the northeast and the surrounding um, areas and regions. Now, they're currently embarking on a very exciting one uh, billion um, rolling development programme in which they are undergoing a major expansion to add thousands of new homes to their already 40,000 strong property portfolio. So I'm sure that uh, in doing that development and, and running with that development, the Helen and the team have faced many different challenges. And I'm sure the current situation with, with COVID-19 has not made anything any, any easier for Helen. So I'm certainly really looking forward to, to hearing Helen's thoughts on, on on the current situation. Also, I've got Matt Chandler. Now, Matt Chandler is a, an associate director at uh, Godwin Developments. Godwin Developments are a national multi-sector developer with a focus on residential, commercial, and industrial schemes across the whole of the UK. Now, similar to myself, uh, Matt has a, a quantity surveying background. Um, and since joining Godwin, has been responsible for schemes that range in value from 10 million to, to 60 million pound. And that includes such things as a uh, high, high end residential, commercial offices, um, industrial, and also town regeneration schemes. So again, firstly for myself, I'd be really interested to hear a, a developer's view of the current situation. Now, before I, um, we get going with the, with the discussion as such, um, one thing I would like to re-emphasise is obviously the interaction. Um, I think it's really important that, that we can engage with you all this morning. And so please do use the, the, the chat function um, that you've got uh, below. We will, you know, between us, hopefully try and answer as many as a, of those questions as we possibly, possibly can. Now, of course, if we don't have time to answer them, then please do use the, the networking function later on. I will certainly be hanging around for for a for a while after um, this morning's session. So if you do want to discuss anything in more detail with me, then please do get in touch. And I'm sure Helen and, and Matt will also be um, hanging around for a short while afterwards as well. So thank you very much for joining us. And I'll hand over to Phil, who I think is going to kick off the, the panel discussion. Thank you, John. Uh, just to echo John's words here, with a panel of experts like this, it's a great opportunity for you to uh, to pose any questions that you would like on these forms of uh, contracts. So, so straight into it, really, um, with you, Helen. Just um, interested if you could reference your your current experience of JCT contracts um, and and what your view is um, of the effect that COVID nineteen has had on the industry so far. Sure, <clears throat> sure. Thank you, Phil. Um, uh, just to set a little bit of context. Um, so at present, we, we, you know, we've got quite an ambitious program at thirteen to to grow um, quite significantly our, our our increase in stock levels. Um, we do buy a mixture of units from developers, but we we have a number of sites that we are, you know, developing from cradle to grave. Um, the effect at the minute with COVID nineteen, what we see is often requests for extension of time, which, you know, we, we, we're we amenable to, but the cost implication, uh, there's also a request for cost. And that causes us issues as a, as a registered provider because everything that we do, especially given our geographical location, um, impacts upon our appraisal, um, on our golden rules, our hurdle rates. Um, and it's, it's quite difficult. Um, you know, we'll have justifications with our board to have to explain why we have significant um, cost variance. So at the minute, it's it's we we're, we're sort of hampered as well by a procurement process because of the existing framework that we've got in terms of being fair to all of our um, the contractors that's on our panel. Uh, but we are, you know, we do have a social conscience and we are keen to to help and uh, uh, mitigate wherever wherever we can. Obviously, the, the intention is that we're still meeting our Homes England targets in order to, to deliver um, and we can still, you know, hit our own internal targets for the number of homes that we that we build every year. 
um, <clears throat> I think to send a bit of context as well, it's it's quite difficult um, to in sort of personal experience when you're looking at appraisals at the moment um, where there's a lot of abnormals in the ground in the northeast. Um, land is the the type of land that we that we are offered. It's not often green belt. So to try and make um, schemes work that are financially viable for us um, is it is it can be a challenge. Uh, we when we go out to tender, we obviously you know we use the standard JCT uh, design and build contract. There's a lot of variables that's in there. It's not often the most efficient uh, use, um, but it's. It's tried and tested. It does what it says on the tin for a for a contractor, and we don't have all of those in house expertise that you would that a big house builder will have. Um, so we do rely on on some of our partner and stakeholders um, for for external support where where possible. I think at the moment with with JCT, um, we did want to move away from sort of the traditional DB. Um, I think especially at the moment we're about to embark on a new framework. Um, where we are looking in detail at the impact of COVID-19, what our future framework will look like, what we are willing to concede on and how we can concede because we have targets that we need to meet because of the uh, the issues that we have for cost and making schemes viable. Um, so it's at the minute, it's, it's quite a challenging, challenging time. Um, I seem to be in discussions with with contractors um, at the moment where we've had JCTs that have been in almost agreed form before we went into lockdown. And now I find myself having lots of arguments um, and squabbles over um, over amendments that we that we simply just can't agree to um, because it will either impact on time or cost. Um, so I think that, that sort of sets out where where I am. Uh, and the business that is present in terms of JCT and building uh, units present out of the ground ourselves. Thank you. Um, with a billion pound a bill programme and you as the legal director, I guess you're quite busy. Well, I know you're quite busy at this moment in time. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is busy. It's. Um, <clears throat> I think it's fair to say, as, as, as you know, discussing, it's, it's the challenge of working from home, I think, and even being able to have those conversations um, with your partners it's quite difficult. Um, it's a lot of concentration. You probably saw that I had a three-year-old milling around um, a few moments ago. It, it can be a bit of a distraction when you're trying to um, to keep to time and to keep to target. Our, our board are, are ambitious. Our chief, my chief exec is very ambitious. Um, there is a, a need and a desire to to build homes that people want to live in um, and that they would aspire to live in. Um, We've been working hard on what our offer is, our customer offer, um, and even the investment program that sits in the back of that, but, you know, behind all of that. Um, it, it is, it, it certainly is, um, it's not the norm at 13. I think it's the, what they, they want to try and do is, 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 is step away from sort of some of the traditions of the RP. We've got um, our own construction company, that we acquired uh, two years ago now, and we have our own market sales division, um, and we are very supportive. And, and I suppose in terms of the recovery plan, um, we are in the <clears throat> we're in a combination of the restart, the reset, and also a bit of the reinvent because we're looking at the program. You know, we're keen to see what the next round of government funding is like. Um, keen to resolve the framework, keen to source new opportunities for our market sales division as well as the, the tradi traditional RP business. Um, and where the, the newly acquired construction company will, will come into play um, without having all of our eggs in one basket, utilising other uh, contractors, you know, where we've got, you know, really good schemes that we can that we can give them and to keep them interested. Okay. So, Matt, um I I um, I know you've got a fairly ambitious program. It might not quite be a billion pounds, but but I know Godwin's been in serious growth mode over the last few years, hasn't it? So so in in terms of you know your experience of JCT contracts and COVID nineteen, how how is the world looking for Godwin at the moment? 
Well, uh, we've been quite fortunate in, in lots of ways. A couple of the jobs we had finished uh, back in the last year, early part of this year, before the sort of world went a bit upside down, really. So um, that helped That helped a lot. We got, we've got handovers to the various end users we were working with before it all happened, which was good. They've, they've had to sort of delay their opening of some of the stores, which we've handed over, sort of the little, which is a bit delayed in Birmingham. It's open today, though, which is good news. Um, their fit out, their three months fit out was pushed back a bit. But uh, no, they've cracked on and done a really good job. I mean, in, in terms of the future for us and what it looks like, um, we've got to get stuff on site end of this year, first part of next year. Um, and we will have to have some frank conversations with those build partners. Um, but I think what I'll probably come on to later is I think it needs to be really pragmatic because we can't all sit in our every towers and dictate terms because, frankly, everyone's got to come through this together, haven't they? So I think we will try and come at it as, collaborative, as collaboratively as we possibly can do. Uh, in order to achieve, as Helen said, those sort of board objectives, the appraisals, making sure everything works, maybe have to reinvent how we look at some of our procurement of various materials and the like, maybe a less reliance on external and sort of uh, foreign, in, foreign imports rather than maybe looking more internal, um, just to sort of ensure that we don't have backlogs of issues of windows not turning up when they should do and things like that. So, yeah, there's quite a lot of stuff we're looking at at the moment. Um, but also, I think at the moment, possibly, if I was being a little bit um, pessimistic or maybe being a bit facetious, I think some contractors I've spoken to, this has come at an opportune time, and it was they possibly had some other delays that were causing them problems, and this is papered over those cracks, really. So um, that's the sort of that's the sort of juxtaposition to that, and I'm probably a bit of an inconvenient truth. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a really trying time for everyone, and I think everyone just needs to realise that and and not be too adversarial. Really, that's probably where we are as a as a business. Uh, a cheeky little comment there about uh, contractors. I expect a response on the chat at some point. But uh, um, so, John, we're in. We're in officially day ninety one. Um, uh, day day ninety one. I think of lockdown since since um, since March. Um, I guess HKA has been quite busy over the last few months um, in terms of reacting to this. Yeah, I guess, you know, different to, to maybe some industries, you know, construction didn't fully shut down. So, you know, as opposed to, I suppose, the entertainment or retail um, industries and leisure industries, which, you know, had to essentially just shut down overnight. You know, construction was almost left in a, in a bit of a um, state of flux. You know, in, there was a lot of uncertainty um, as to as to what construction needed to do. And, and certainly we had a lot of phone calls from from clients both contractors and, and developers just say look what what should we be doing here you know some sites are still open some sites are still going to to, to do the work um some contractors have taken it upon themselves to 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 essentially shut um the sites or, or essentially to, to stop going to the site so so from a um from from hk perspective yeah we had a lot of phone calls saying look we don't, you know, a lot of contractors saying we don't normally have had, you know, issues such as epidemics or pandemics or using uh, the force majeure type clauses in contracts. So essentially just simply asking what should we be doing now? You know, how do we protect our our position? And equally from an employer's perspective, you know, asking should we be issuing any instructions to the contractors or is there a, a risk in doing that. So, so yeah, re really um, interesting comments that uh, you know and queries that we've had over the past few months. What has been interesting and what has been good to see is the way that the Construction Leadership Council has has really acted quite quickly um, during lockdown and, and um, quite rightly have positioned themselves as one of the go to organisations as 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 far as the construction industry is concerned. So I just wondered, um, Helen, if you could comment sort of briefly on the CLC's sort of roadmap to recovery, their three steps um, as per their recent report in terms of what the industry needs to do to sort of get back on track in, in uh, you know, macro terms, really. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think this echoes where 13 is um, also. We've been quite conscious since we went into lockdown that we – as a as a quasi public authority, um, as a, as a social landlord, would be under a duty to support the construction industry and our partners in in mobilising um, quite quickly. Once lockdown was over, we've been in a similar situation. 
you know, as, as John described, where we've had one contract has continued to work with implementing safe social distancing, um, um, others that have just, including our own internal contractors, shut down site because of the supply chain. Um, in terms of restart, we we spent a number of, of days and weeks even um, preparing reports to board so that we could advise, you know, where we were in terms of um, mobilisation, what we needed to do, how we could restart safely, um, how we could maximise the opportunities, which opportunities we were going to take forward first and foremost, um, which were politically sensitive, dare I say, which were, um, you know, within the business interest to do so. Um, and, and also looked at the the contractor solvency position. You know, we, we've certainly changed our view on contractor risk um, and there's more of a focus with procurement colleagues now um, and there's a lot more monitoring than there ever used to be just because of the concerns that have been, that have been felt in the past, um, I think as as an RP, sometimes we're not always, um, or we haven't in, historically been prepared for an insolvency, but we're certainly making sure that we our contracts reflect a sort of a, rob, a more robust um, governance position on that in terms of guarantees that we would expect. Um, but certainly to say that there's, there has been an awful lot of work on projects. You know, our planning and technical team were um, still ongoing with projects. To make sure, and we've just just submitted planning application two weeks ago, um, in order to for, for a new scheme that we that we're going live within in Middlesbrough. Um, so we are keen on that. We're certainly heavily involved in the restart and the reset um, that the CLC have set out in terms of pipeline. You know, we are certainly searching for new opportunities. We've got an ambitious program. We've got targets from our Wave Homes England uh, grant funding uh, we need to get on site quick um, and we need to make sure that's happen happening um, and we need to to really make sure that we've that we are taking on board um, you know <clears throat> what is out there what our end customer needs also but more how we can support support the construction industry generally but in a procurement in a compliant procurement manner okay I just want to correct myself. It's day 81 of lockdown. I don't want to get ahead of myself, actually, from that point of view. Let's not wish the time away any more than we need to. So, um, so Matt, the the, um, the CLC's roadmap, you know, restart, reset, reinvent. What What's what's your sort of view on, on you know, the guidelines that they're putting out there at the moment? Well, I think, as, what, as John said, I think from the contractors we've spoken to and we work most closely with, I don't think, um, obviously, they've had a massively, heavily, 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 and I'll be corrected by the delegates on the panel, on, on the on the, on the the uh, attendees as well, um, heavily reduced sort of workforce, um, but not entirely stopped. And there's only been a couple of sites which have had to entirely stop. They've been at a sort of a running at 20% um, type of efficiency. So that restart isn't hopefully from a complete standing start. It should be from a from a bit of a sort of momentum. Um, as, of, as of sort of last week when I spoke to them, they were up to about 65% of their workforce back again. Again, that varies across various projects. If you're in a big groundwork space, you could work quite remotely, quite easily um, and quite effectively in, 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 in the sort of very, very spread out site. Obviously, if you're in the throes of, a, of an apartment fit out and you've got various different trades all needing to be next to each other, that is very challenging. Um, so that restart function, I think, hopefully, is, is logical. I think what the CLC have done is, is really spot on. It, it addresses everything that needs to be done. Um, and I think it gives a really clear path to hopefully addressing you know, all those things, which are sort of quite well trodden narratives now, but the reinvention, uh, starting again, trying to go to modular, all that, that pharma report that came out. I mean, that was, it, it talks about, it, it really gives a really good chance to do that. And that's number three, the reinvent gives us that pathway but it how long this goes on will determine how effective that reinvention is because if it if it lasts longer i think people really will um have to reinvent how they how they design schemes as i said that that depends probably on a more uk-based manufacturing type setup um but generally it's um if it, if it comes back to normal quite quickly people might fall back into old habits so uh that we've seen that across lots of lots of different things as not least of which with sort of the remote working, our, our type of sectors we're getting into as well and working with and what we're seeing bounce back as well. So, yeah, I think it's a logical step from the CLC. It's, it's the only way to do it really, isn't it, frankly? You can't, you, can't, you can't just make everyone go, 
back to completely as it was because that's just not safe, is it? So it's a, it's a measured restart uh, with hopefully a way to, to get us back on, on track in the short to medium term. Really. So, John, from a contractual point of view, when you talk about reset and reinvent, then then you're opening yourself up to, to um, quite a lot of uh, potential contractual issues that are going to come from that because how you reset and how you reinvent when when you're midway through a contract, I guess, is where the real challenges are going to lie over the next six to 18 months or so. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I mean... In terms of first and foremost, you know the the the, the restart is, is vitally important. You know, construction has uh, as a proportion of GDP is obviously very important, and so you know politicians will always look to construction to perhaps kickstart the the economy. So the importance of getting through that first phase is, is vital. But then, as you say, you know the the, the sort of reset. How how do we um, how do we drive through that demand? in the industry can we um can, can we sort of push through uh, a lot of the you know the, the work that needs to be done but also keeping in mind the public health guidelines that are in place you know how, how can we still achieve the productivity levels that, that we need in the industry or, or is that going to be a, a big issue for us now of course you know for, for me, I think the, the the big issue, as Matt touched on, really, is going to be the the, the reinvention. Um, you know, I think there will be a temptation to sort of say, well, let's look at construction prior to lockdown. We were in a pretty good place, you know. So why why should we reinvent? You know, why 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 should we you know go to the trouble of reinventing something that that wasn't broken prior to lockdown? Um, personally, I don't agree with that. I think there is. There is a, a real need to reinvent. I think, you know, things like modern methods of construction that Matt again touched on there in terms of modular builds, I think that will have to be driven more. And, you know, we'll see that construction will change it in that respect. Also, um, digitalization. You know, I was uh, on a um, an internal training course with one of my colleagues, Sarah Kate. Um, a few weeks ago, who who's an expert in uh, sort of BIM and 4D modelling, and and that sort of opened my eyes to to the to the potentials there with with BIM, you know, and how that can improve efficiency um, in the industry. So so for me, I think we can't lose focus. Um, but I guess you know what Matt said in terms of how long this goes on for will have a real influence on whether we do reinvent in the right way. Absolutely. So uh, we've covered off the macro issues there. I've got a lot of questions coming through the chat, as you guys have probably seen. So uh, I think it would be prudent to uh, tick off some of these. Um, so um, I'll whisk through some of the questions so we can get through some of these. I'm going to suggest that you don't necessarily all need to answer these, but but um, let's pick up. Let's pick up on the first one from Robert Green, who who asked a very good question. Um, how do we deal with extensions of time claims where work has been interrupted by the pandemic on JCT um, intermediate uh, contract? Um, so, Helen, you talked about you talked about time and costs, but let's just deal with time in this particular one. So how do we deal with extensions of time? I mean, that's a big question I get <laughs> from Robert, so maybe just pick an aspect of that. Uh, Helen, I think you need to... Um, Sorry, I was on mute there. Um, I think we have a, a variety of contracts um, already built in where we have um, a, either a two or three month extension built in. Um, it's 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 difficult because at present, um, and this is just purely coming at it from, a, from an RP's perspective um, and, and how we personally view these things, we are we, we're quite amenable to requests as they come through. We have had actually had one uh, site, dare I say, where um, a force majeure um, was requested, uh, but that contract had actually been subcontracted. Um, and it was actually the, the contractor itself that then refused and wanted to get the, the contractor back on site, um, which is... That I think, as Matt alluded to, that was 
covering up the cracks, uh, papering over the cracks of something that was already broken, where we were already um, in a liquidated damages position, where um, there were significant um, delays on site. We've lost customers who had reservations, um, and we really had some some tough issues on that particular site. Um, in terms of, um, I think we've, we've we've bounced across the the relevant event and the force majeure. Uh, what we would do um, and, and how we would approach that, um, and I think, off the top of my head, we were we were sort of in the in the situation of um, when it comes to renewing or, or, or dealing with a variation, the horse is sort of already bolted in a way um, in terms of especially if you're asking to a variation before a contract's been signed which causes us issues um, if we wanted to go down that route. And again, this is an RP. We probably would have to go back to board if it's not something that's already sitting within our framework. Um, I'm not quite sure that probably answers the question. We've yeah, no, It's a difficult question. It's yeah. a good question because, uh, Matt, I'll come to you on force majeure um, in a minute just to give you a bit of thinking time. But, but John... Um, so Robert asked a supplementary question, perhaps a bit more specific, and asks, um, how do we deal with a contractor claiming time is at large as a subcontractor can't get accommodation in Wales? Again, referring to JCT um, immediate. What, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, time, time at large. I mean, JCT now generally has, a, has more of a capsule provisions in, in terms of um, awarding extensions of time. And, and I guess... The, the issue that we've got here and the reasons why there may not be accommodation in Wales is obviously related to the situation with the pandemic. So with, with JCT, as opposed to, you know, it's slightly different to, to other forms of contracts, such as just NEC that deal with time and money together. You know, JCT will look at time separately. And, and so what, first and foremost, what we have to do is look at the contractual provisions and what constitutes a relevant event. So the relevant event here would likely be the um, the force majeure event. Now, now, JCT doesn't define what force majeure is, and the main reason for that is that it doesn't want to restrict what could possibly be encompassed by the force majeure event. So the current situation, I think it's fairly likely, you know, or more than likely that this would constitute a force majeure event. And so the extension of time would be would be awarded, in my view, under the force majeure event. Um, and so time at large wouldn't necessarily come into it. You know, of course, time at large, we're seeing less and less time at large cases now because, you know, the standard forms of contracts do try to have more catch-all provisions so that these events will fall within the extension of time provision itself. So I think that you know, it, it wouldn't fall outside of, of the JCT relevant events. So we've got a couple of questions um, following on from that. We've got one from um, Hayley Driver and also Ray Ford, which um, you could probably see Matt in, 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 in here. So Ray is asking, you know, do you think that Force Majeure is a relevant event with respect to COVID-19? And, and um, Hayley asks, you know, given that Force Majeure is a relevant event but not a relevant matter under what clause are the contractors making claim for costs now i know you're not got too many active sites at the moment so so you'll maybe need to go back to uh, your qs training on this one matt and give us a give us a view yeah i mean it's a difficult one isn't it i mean not being a lawyer i always put that as a bit at the beginning um and not being legally trained i sort of i, I sort of don't i sometimes dance around the handbags a bit on these points but um I think in insofar as what John said and what Helen said, it, if it, it's a reasonable approach, isn't it, to force majeure? They don't listen because it's, it's, it's ones that need to be assessed and their own weight given at the time. So um, I don't think anyone in the world would say that this was a percent for something which you could foreseeably reasonably see um, uh, and could include as something which a contractor should allow for. Um, that said, you sort of everyone needs to sort of, that's where I come back to my collaboration point at the beginning, that people need to realise that everyone is in this largely together. We can't be too adversarial because we need the job to be finished and that's that would be the case over and over again. So it, it, it's a time factor. I mean, the contracts I've spoken to, are, yeah, they're getting their time extension. The cost the cost implication, I, I, would, I think it'd be a difficult one to argue. But that said, if you're a 
it's just like an example, you're a student accommodation provider, you want to get your, you need to get it completed by August because otherwise you don't get paid by August, you don't get students in, the whole thing goes up in smoke a bit. Um, and so you want to, you want that to open. If, for instance, the extension of time is such that it will push you past the date where you won't achieve to the next academic year, do you have a frank conversation on a sort of case by case basis and say, we need to accelerate the programme to get it completed by that point? I realise it's not an irrelevant matter, so you shouldn't get money for it. But actually, to achieve the end, we all need to, because we all live in the realistic and pragmatic world. Do you achieve, do you, do you, do you come to that sort of, sort of compromise? Because that's where it's going to be a lot of this stuff. There'll be, and, and, and frankly, um, lawyers get it so right so much of the time, but there always needs to be a bit of pragmatism to get in these solutions uh, through. So um, that's probably, I realise there may not be a money request, a money, a legitimate money application, but actually, if the means, so sort of the ends justify the means, that's possibly a way of looking at it. So I know it's probably a bit of a, bit of a sort of fluffy answer, but um, hopefully that gives a bit of context. Pragmatism is a good word, though. So uh, yes, that's that's uh, that's good to introduce that into the conversation quite early, isn't it? I, I think. Mm, uh, hope so. I think I think it needs to be, doesn't it? Really. I've got a uh, specific question that was uh, sort of teed up before here, then, which I'll I'll, I'll come to you, Helen, because I want to get into this time versus cost uh, debate here. So I've got a specific situation here. So so can we recover time and money associated with delays caused by COVID-19 under JCT? What about any subsequent delays because of, for instance, material delivery postponements from overseas? How do you kind of bring the overseas element into this discussion? That's a very good question. Um, Again, I think when it comes to materials, I think you'd be you'd be hard pressed, wouldn't you, not to allow for an extension of time quite reasonably. If you if you got into an adjudication, how could you justify not granting someone an extension of time when the appropriate materials are not available? Um, and I suppose you know, if, in that situation, I'd be I'd be hard. I, I, I can't really think of um, of of a reason why anyone would want to object to an extension of time for that for that particular reason. Um, on the cost side, I think we were already prepared for, for the fact that um, costs are going to increase as that you know, especially if we go into lockdown phase two, if the supply chain dries up again, what's going to be the the, the impact um, on sourcing materials from elsewhere? Um, it's certainly um, a been food for, for discussion and thought within within our organisation, um, and I think if people can justify how they would, and then they can quantify their loss, um, it would be something that therefore you could consider, you know, reasonably certainly as a as an RP if that if that request came across, um, but you know if it was for. If it, you know, if it's for bricks or the material or something, you know, it needs to come out of the ground and you know that there's supply chain issues, you know, you can look at this and take a, a very pragmatic view. But if it's, you, you know, if it's just someone wanting to bear 50 percent of any cost increase that they've had generally, then that's not something that we're, we're going to be able to accept. Um, yeah, and I think it just depends upon the nature of we, we've had very different requests that's come through as a business. Um, and you, you can only take, you know, you can only look at them in a considered case by case manner for each particular one. There's certainly not a blanket um, meets all approach that you can take to these to the to the requests that come through. I know we're throwing a lot of hypothetical examples at you here, Helen. So, so um, uh, you're dealing with them well here, um, John. Um, if uh, this, uh, I love the fact that the questions are. Coming in fast and furious, and Bill Barton and Steve Tyrrell, you'll have seen uh, towards the bottom of the of the chat train, have uh, have asked a question that I wonder to keep this particular train going. Bill Barton says, "Is it about foreseeability?" And Steve Tyrrell says, "What about alternative materials?" Good question. Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, just the, just going back on on the time um, situation with materials, I mean, again, the likelihood is is that the only provision that that contractors are going to be able to rely on is the force majeure. And force majeure is obviously, you know, circumstances beyond the control of the parties. So in terms of materials coming um, from overseas, then in my view, you know, the, the contractor is probably going to be entitled to an extension of time, provided that that difficult, well, no, provided the lack of materials is down to COVID-19, 
and, and the fact that they, they, they can't source alternative materials. Now, just because it may be more difficult to, sort, to source materials probably isn't good enough. You know, that risk is probably going to lie with the contractor. And of course, you know, the, the obligation to provide labour and to provide materials onto the site sits with the contractor. So, you know, the reliance has to, this has to be an event that is beyond the control of the parties. So if they could go to an alternative material supplier, then then that, you know, may may be the case. And they may have to do that. So... Yeah, so, so in terms of um, the cost side of things, force majeure isn't a relevant matter. So, so unfortunately, you know, the contractors, or fortunately, depending on which side of the fence you sit, I suppose, that um, force majeure doesn't entitle them to the costs. So whilst the, you know, there will be some entitlement to, to, to time, which would uh, save them from the imposition of uh, liquidated damages, then there isn't any any uh, additional cost recovery that can be taken from that. Now, a lot of people have discussed the potential that you know change in law and and you know change in, in law after the base date may come to the savour of contractors. But again, we must remember that you know the UK government hasn't prevented us from carrying on in construction, so there's no legislation being passed to stop construction work, and so. Absent again an employer's instruction for the contractor to stop or to suspend the works, then then again that wouldn't, in my view, entitle the contractors to to, to claim the money side of of um, of COVID, the COVID situation. And Bill Barton's comment: It is about foreseeability. Blimey, if, if we're going to take the lid off uh, foreseeability, we could be here for quite a while with that one. Bill, I suggest you pick that up with HKA offline in the exhibition area or the networking to um, to talk about that. But uh, uh, thank you for that. Bill Bill then asks a very specific question, which which is quite an interesting one. So we he says, we've recently negotiated contracts with Brexit and material and COVID clauses. These are subject to prior discussion and agreement and frequently an agreement as to who is taking all or part of the risk. So... Are we? Is this something that you've experienced, Helen? Is this is this now part and parcel of of agreeing contracts at the outset now with these sorts of clauses in? I think we've had requests to vary where we haven't signed um, contracts to date, but we are having the internal discussions because our existing framework is due to expire in July, um, and it, this is this is the exact point that we've had. Um, We've had sort of disaster planning sessions internally for for Brexit for situation, um, and it's it's definitely been at the forefront of discussion. I think in the future, then yes, I think you would have to be that prudent and um, that commercially minded to have those discussions because you know we we are aware we are aware of the risks. Um, of what contractors, the supply chain, and as a business, it's going to pause. So, yeah, I think it it's definitely the future of having an open and commercial discussion, um, more of an open book discussion and, and being really clear and honest of, 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 of how we can share and, and bear the risk um, in order to get houses constructed um, in a in a timely in a timely manner that, that, that's satisfied for both parties. So, yeah, it's this is definitely going to form our framework um, when it eventually goes live. So, Matt, you're very much in uh, planning and design and procurement stage right now for a lot of your jobs. Is 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 this Brexit and COVID clause? Is this is this something that you're um, already seeing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's filtered through to our, our land purchases as well. Have a COVID clause, and if we uh, well, they had a Brexit clause, and in relation to if challenging things come through from. I mean, that's very hard to sort of pin, pin on. And, and same with the COVID point, if we haven't had responses on various times, we obviously have contractual timescales to complete various submissions of planning, um, ground investigations, all that sort of stuff. And if, if there's sort of reasonable, just like in construction contracts, if there's reasonable things which push us past that point, we have to be have an ability to come back and, and, re, and reassess those timescales. But I think on the, on the, the, the material and on the, Equal. I think it's an equal or approved thing. I think we as clients and as sort of hopefully sitting there saying that we have to be reasonable. If there's, there's, there's a, like everything, there's a balance to these things, isn't there? For instance, if 
if you can't get a material you need to complete your job, but there's an equal or approved material out there, and there's a cost implication on it, because you're obviously you've probably ordered already some material from somewhere, so there's a 30% deposit you've already paid, completion of that and and the sort of materials coming into the country, investing certificates, and all that sort of stuff. If you say that 30%, we can't recover that money and we're going to just write that off. But in order to open the doors on the date we said we were going to open the doors, we need to get that material in. Then you take that balanced opinion, don't you, to say that actually that's the lesser of the evil. Let's, part, let's bring that to the fore. Let's get that installed. And then we've actually achieved our aim. We've had a 30% hit on that, that one material. But we've actually achieved our goal. So... I think that's what, and I think that's been that's been nearly for ages. I mean, for instance, in a couple of our jobs, we've got we had some specification materials which did not need to come from the countries that they came from, but are there because it's just lazy specification writing by end users, uh, where they just copy and paste from previous job to job because it's easy to do so. They probably had an agreement behind the scenes, which which they probably were, I don't know, maybe benefiting from elsewhere, um, but then. In, then actually put it, it luckily we didn't have anything to sort of rock the boat at the time but now and i and i really feel sorry for some contractors who are forced down the route of having quite difficult procurement strategies to get certain materials because you just can't always achieve it um so i think you just need to you just need to be able to just sort of have those discussions and and have that it's always that net cost effect isn't it if everyone sees that and gets to that point quicker you can make a really quick judgment call rather than oh it's going to be a, it, it, it's how people dress things up really mm. That's what it is. If, if you say, if you said to someone, "Oh my God, we've got a ten-week delay," and it's like, "Oh," and then you run away, we've got a ten-week delay. It's costing X. And actually, well, we could actually have three weeks delay if you chose to do this. It's just that. It's just that sort of logical thought process, rather than throw all the toys out of the pram because something went wrong. Where things go wrong all the time. I mean, I've not been around as long as, as long as I'm sure a lot of contractors have, and they will go through all of this a million times over. And sometimes it's to their best moment because they dress things up to make them look worse to get a benefit from it. And that's really being a bit disingenuous, but I don't mean to be. But And in the same way, they cover over things which we never find out about because they just they get on with it and it's, and it's dealt with. So I think the, the sharing of the risk is essential to getting us. And we need to be open to changing a material, not being too wedded to things, not being too wedded to how something absolutely looks. But the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is more important of just getting these finished and handed over, really, as I'm sure Helen and housing particularly those numbers and all that funding is backed off all those sort of things those and those handovers and if you can't get them then the funding might not come around we we have the same thing with our investors we need to return an investment to them and if we can't do that then for the sake of a small problem we've, we've really let the tail wag the dog there mm-hmm. yeah so john I, I know one size doesn't fit all and hka are advising clients at different stages here but what what's what, what's the HKA sort of thoughts generally in terms of, uh, you know, Brexit clauses, material clauses and COVID-19 clauses, you know, when setting up new contracts? Yeah, um, j- just clearing one point, actually, which I'll get uh, lynched from my uh, Scottish colleagues. That Obviously, in Scotland, there, there was a, um, uh, a legislation to, to stop um, uh, construction there. So, John... Uh, that's a comment there being made by John Devlin, yeah. which is a valid point. So obviously the situation in Scotland would need to be looked at differently to to, to England um, on that point. But in terms of incorporating uh, bespoke you know, provisions into, into contracts and those types of I think it's vital that the parties do that sensibly, you know, so that that risk profile is shared in, in, in a pragmatic way so that, you know, the risk isn't just, left on one side of the parties because otherwise that's inevitably going to lead to to, to disputes um, and will lead to, uh, to to the parties not really working collaboratively and, and, and I guess that you know the whole situation will get worse if that's not done so so I'd welcome yeah in, in terms of having uh, new new provisions into contracts and I think that's that's inevitable to happen you know um, just picking up on a couple of questions on on the uh, on the chat feed as well. In terms of um, there's one question here from David David Jordan, um, who mentioned that they were instructed to stop on their site by their employer. So again, in that situation, that may well give rise to to an opportunity to claim to claim costs. I mean, of course, uh, I think Danielle Bragg there mentions in Wales that it's enshrined in law. 
that the, so, uh, the social distancing is in legislation. And, and the same applies in England in terms of social distancing. But again, employers haven't been um, coming forward in, in providing instructions to do that because obviously the obligation is on the principal contractor to do that themselves. And so that isn't an instruction by the employer to work in different conditions. So again, you would have to look at the circumstances, the particular circumstances on each contract to look as to whether there is a relevant matter that would entitle you to, to claim cost has come into, come into to, to event really. Um, so, so yeah, some really interesting points on, on the chat there. Um, there I should have clarified earlier, especially about being Welsh. So I should have picked up the, uh, the, the, the points on, on Wales there. So thank you for that, Danielle. Yeah, they're quite interesting, weren't they? A, a rather sort of naughty question from Andrew Drennan, who sort of brings in the driving comment, really, unless you were driving to Barnard Castle for specific circumstances, et cetera, which was, which was good. Um, thank you, Andrew, for bringing um, some humour in there. Um, I want to take a step back from this now. There's a comment from uh, Peter Korth, um, who who says, good response from Matt Chandler, increased uh, collaboration and pragmatism will be essential in getting the industry through these challenging times, which I'm sure we all agree. But there's there's a lot of contractors and subcontractors and suppliers that, that are really struggling for cash at this moment in time. And we know sort of generally what happens in this situation when people are fighting for their lives. It's very easy to try and be pragmatic and uh, collaborate. But what we're, we're in danger now of sort of entering a rather difficult time. Um, how easy is it going to be to remain pragmatic through this, Helen, when you're dealing with some of the supply chain have really had a rough time over the last three months? They have. And we've, you know, as a business, we've had requests um, to release retentions. Um, and I think if extensions have been overdue and perhaps those, um, we know that we're going to get a good product, Um someone should have been out on site but they couldn't because of lockdown we couldn't um, and maintain safe social distancing measures we would take a view on that <clears throat> i think where you're asked to release retention in advance um that causes us an issue from an order perspective um and that's that's one of our our greater issues of, of, of being an rp um is to make sure that that the money the all of the i's are dotted and the t's are crossed at the right point in time um that that's not something that we can necessarily facilitate um at an early stage um we've we've looked at sort of the government um request uh, the, the government format sorry for a formal gct variation um for a couple of matters um what we've done instead is we've um increased payment frequency uh, we've taken a view we've conducted our own financial due diligence on contractors and we have um, done our best to facilitate in other ways if we can get evaluation and that we will and also we'll um, amend our payment terms that's how we're trying to to look at it as a business uh, because we can do that um, we can document it in the right way without getting ourselves into into issue on an internal or an external audit so, so you've been described as a pragmatic matt so so what 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 does the industry need to do really to get through you know these challenging times? Because because it's easy saying one thing, but but you know behaviour from certain firms is going to make it tough for everybody. Yeah, I mean it's incumbent on people, isn't it, to to be level headed and 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 I think everyone on this panel is is, is, is just that really is is trying to as Helen said speed up payments, keep people afloat, keep people cash flow going because as soon as the cash flow goes and then you're reliant upon them to finish your job, then you, you we've had that same problem again, haven't we? So where you, you, if something falls off, that doesn't really help anyone. So if you need to release retention, if you need to increase what you pay for your off-site materials, for instance, to keep your supplier afloat and uh, to make sure they actually get it to site, um, uh, that's how that's how you're going to have to achieve it, really. Um, whether, I'm not suggesting people stunt low prelims or, or the like, but if, if that's what you need to, to check to make it set, set yourself up. And it, it depends It depends on the, the size of the contractor in this instance, though, Phil, doesn't it? Because I think if... In your larger, your top, your tier one contractors uh, will be set up in a way that they have credit lines which they can extend, 
Um, they're happy for that to be the case. I mean, the latest JCT update, obviously, in 2016, put it on the payment to be increased, the speed to be increased. Um, so uh, we, we, as a, we, as a, we, as a, we, as an organisation, run what we think to be pretty good payment terms. We, we try and get everything sorted within them. And the only reason it's ever late is if we have a dispute over whether or not we think that they, they've applied for too much at one point, but that dealt with very quickly, um, breakdowns and the like, and we, and we get that sorted. So we need we need people to work for us, um, just like, um, and then quickly and effectively. So it, 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 it's no benefit enough for us to be anything other than effective and, and pragmatic, really. John, what sort of behaviour um, are you seeing throughout the supply chain at the moment you know we're only really getting into this aren't we but but are other signs are that people are being sensible i think so yeah absolutely um i think just to you know the 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 comments of uh, the lord chief justice lord barnett said that um that you know more than ever parties should should look to compromise um you know and find a way through uh, the current situation, and and from speaking to to, to my clients, then I, I think that is the way you know, that parties are approaching things. There's certainly, um, a few of our clients have come to us and said, "Look, we don't want to get involved in any protracted legal disputes here. You know, we want to talk with with the other side and and find a sensible way out." And and in fact, we've um, We've started a new service line, which is a, an independent uh, facilitation uh, facilitator service, um, which essentially is bringing parties together and, and reviewing the issues that they've faced with COVID-19 and setting out a, a roadmap as to how they can deal with these issues and, and measuring how delays should be um, assessed and, and, and how costs should be assessed in a, in a sensible way so that you know parties don't then just get embroiled in 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 dispute and, and in correspondence and so you know that is something that i'm finding the parties are willing to do that to the moment um you know having said that speaking to um some of my colleagues that act as as adjudicators they are certainly extremely busy at the at the moment um and I guess that comes down to, you know, cash. It, you know, it's the lifeblood of the industry. And I guess some contractors, subcontractors simply can't wait um, to, to do those negotiations and they're having to uh, proceed to formal dispute resolution. I suppose the, you know, the most expedient way of doing that is through adjudication. Uh, and, and, and again, um, from what I hear, the RICS has seen a, a sharp increase in requests for nominations of adjudicators. So, so I think there is a, whilst there is a desire to, to negotiate and to work together, obviously it is a bit of a, a mixed bag and a mixed response in the industry. Okay, let's see if we can uh, pick up a couple of uh, uh, specific questions. Uh, Thomas Evans um, is asking, as a subcontractor, are we entitled to a claim to cover costs relating to additional accommodation and means transport? to ensure operatives maintain a social distance. Um, Helen, it's probably your turn on that before I go to John. Um, I think first and foremost, it depends upon what's, what, what form of contract you're using, what's contained in that contract, what uh, variations you've made, made to standard form, um, in terms of what's allowed for it. Um, and then I suppose it goes back to that, that force majeure element of it. it is it, um, sorry, not force majeure event. It goes back to uh, to, to the, the reasonableness and the cost um, as a variation under the contract. Um, from an RP perspective, I would say no. Um, but then again, that's just because we have an eye on the appraisal um, and we've got to look at I suppose it's all geographics, isn't it, as to um, what part of the world that you're in and what you're used to to seeing. Um, I would I would find that difficult to justify to my board, um, to be honest, um, unless there was a very valid reason for doing so, why we would agree to that sort of variation um, for cost. Um, obviously, the, the form of contract that, contract that we has does allow for variables um, in there, um, 
it's not always the most efficient contract that we use and we are looking to sort of change just to, to step away from using the the DMB um, and to go to more potentially for a without without quantities contract um, so we can nail down costs a lot more. Um, so, yeah, I suppose it, it comes down to realistically what whatever is in the contract uh, if there's provision for that in the contract, if there's a variable sum in the contract that it would that you could that it would be as like as a catch-all, then 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 you may be able to get away with it. But if it came across as it being outside of that realm, then I think you might be hard pressed uh, to to ask someone to to um, accept that. Okay, thank you. That was a good answer to a very uh, specific uh, question. So, John, we're at uh, twelve o'clock now. I don't know whether you just want to. To summarise the session and just say a few words before we sort of move into speed networking and exhibition. Yeah, I mean, you know, first and foremost, thank you to to, to, the, to the rest of the panel. You know, um, some really uh, interesting views and, and discussions there, and also to the participants that have you know engaged really well, and and that obviously helps us in terms of how we interact with you and answering some of these these questions. And again. You know, looking at, at the industry, I think there is a desire to to work together to, to to move our way through this. And and I think a lot of the questions, you know, haven't been necessarily contentious in terms of well, we want to claim this or we want to recover that amount of money. It's well, how can we do this together? You know, how you know is there a, a way of doing that in collaboration? And I guess that's the only way we can um, move forward on this. Just, just picking up on, on that um, last point in terms of, of the to cover the costs of accommodation and the like. Again, it will be very difficult because the onus will be on each contractor and subcontractor to make sure that they are working to the current public health guidelines. And so absent, again, a specific instruction from the employer to, to ensure that you do this um, or that they ask you to do this, then there will be an onus on yourselves to be providing additional accommodation in any event. So, so again, whilst the contract may not allow for it, I think the idea is to discuss with the contracting parties to try and find a sensible solution for all this, because it is, you know, it really is unprecedented. So I don't think any party would have expected they'd be working in the way that they are. So I'd just like to thank you, Phil, for uh, for chairing it, and uh, it's been really enjoyable for me. So I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, Matt and Helen. I. Uh, I suspect if you move into the exhibition area and the networking area, you will be uh, three of the most popular people in the conference now. And, and um, I would invite everybody to just sort of move move into the other areas now and, and uh, pick up some of these very specific points that you're raising here with with um, with speakers uh, and colleagues. So um, enjoy the networking. We will be back in half an hour to have a very similar discussion around the NEC form of contract. So we'll see you very shortly. Thank you.